the boo-boo. Hi, and welcome back to Tell Me What Happened, the yeah, podcast that features folks from all walks of life telling us of one childhood experience and how that event like impacted you. them as an adult. I'm your host, Jay Rehack, and like you, I've had my share of childhood experiences, some of them good, some of them kind of painful. But I like to think that everything that's ever happened to me has made me who I am today. Tell Me What Happened is sponsored by Sidelining Publishing, publishers of quality books, including Susan Salador's classic, One Little Act of Kindness. Tell Me What Happened is also sponsored by LaughSaver.com. Visit LaughSaver.com and record your laughter. We'll keep it for you, now and forever. It's free, and your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren will appreciate it. That's LaughSaver.com. LaughSaver.com And by the way, LaughSaver.com will become an app starting June 1st, 2022. So check your phones and download the app. All right. Today I have as my guest, Tom Avitable. Tom's an overall great guy, also a great drummer. He's a best-selling author. He's a book coach. And he's done 50 years of award-winning writing and producing. And in his latest venture, he's doing voiceover for books. And perhaps most impressively, he is the founder of the Online Academy of Creative Skills. Welcome to the show, Tom. Hey, nice to be here. Well, it's an honor to have you, Tom. I know you're coming in from New York, somewhere uh, along the Hudson River, maybe, or uh, is it the other yeah, side? Yeah, we're just we're just on the opposite side of the great city of New York, looking at all the lights and the buildings. All right. Well, when I grow up, I want to be you. I want to be a best-selling author, but I'm going to leave that alone for right now. Well, Tom, I can you help re- you. I can help you with the uh, Academy of with my Academy. We have a class called From Writer to Author. And if it's very reasonable, it's 15 classes, and it'll help you write a more publishable manuscript. I like it. I like it. I was a school teacher for 35 years, and I taught writing, but I think I could probably learn a lot from you. So we'll talk about that offline, but it sounds like a plan. God bless you for being a teacher. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it was a great career. Tom, you ready to tell your story? Oh, me? Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get out of the way, Tom, and All right. I'm going to ask you at the end of it absolutely one question, and that one question is this. How do you think that experience, that childhood event, has impacted who you are today? But take it away, Tom. Okay. Well, thanks for the opportunity. I was born in the Bronx, and I lived in the kind of apartment where you had to bang on the pipes to get heat. I slept in a snowsuit. It didn't get much better after that. Never had a real new bike. All my bikes were put together bikes. All the cars I had when I got older were all from the junkyard. Never had a new car. Uh, But one thing I did have was a kind of a curiosity about science, mostly electronics. So in junior high school, I built a computer and an attache case. This was before there was an electronic calculator. And in that attache case, and I did that because a man from Uncle and from Russia with Love and everything was in an attache case, so I built this computer. So I quickly found out that if I cut school, which is, I can you know, statute of limitations is now beyond, so I can admit this. I used to cut school and go downtown with the the attache case. And I go into these big office buildings like Union Carbide or Chase Bank or like that and press all the buttons on the elevator. And at every door, when it opened, I'd sniff. And what I was sniffing for was computer tape because in those days, computers used these big reels of tape to record the data. So one day I'm down in the RCA building because, hey, they make computers. And I go in and I meet my first challenge of my young life elevator operators. Can't push all the buttons. So I get on an elevator with my attache case. I was kind of big for my age. Nobody really questioned me. This is well before security. So I'm in there with all these grownups and the door opens on five and I smell it. So I get out and I walk around. And normally what I'm looking for is a glass window, raised floors, computer cabinets, IBM, Honeywell, data control, something like that. And it's usually a very pristine environment. And there's always a door that says, you know, authorized personnel only, which I violate freely because I'm just a kid with an attache case. Anyway, I'm walking around and uh, all of a sudden I see gigantic tape machine. It's really big. Wow, it's bigger than a Honeywell. I mean, Honeywell had three quarter inch tape and this thing looks like two inch tape, like almost. And then I look and I realize that Frank Gorshin, 
who played the Riddler on Batman, is on a little monitor off to the right of this giant machine, and standing next to him is Dean Martin. And they're in shirt sleeves smoking a cigarette, and Dean Martin's wearing glasses. And you never see that. And I realized suddenly, because I'm from an Italian-American family, and we, if you don't watch a Dean Martin show every, every week, it's almost a blasphemy, that last night, Dean said, oh, next week, our guest will be Frank Gorshin. So I quickly realized that what I was watching at 1130 in the morning was the shooting of the Dean Martin show being fed from the West Coast to the New York offices of NBC. At that moment, some guy tapped me on the shoulder and said, what are you doing here? And the quickest I ever thought in my life, I had, with the computer, I had what we call sequential access. It was a tape machine that rolled at high speed, then found the data, and then played back the data. And I quickly said to the guy, well, I'm here to sell you something. Tell me what? I said, I'm going to sell you a machine that you can put all your news stories on one tape and play them back in any order you want. He said, we don't need that. I said, oh, okay. Now I'm just looking to get out of it, you know, because <laughs> I've been caught. And he says, come on, I'll show you. And he takes me to this all glass studio on the fifth floor. And we walk through the door and there is all these tape machines. And he picks up something which later is actually called a cartridge or a Fidela pack cartridge. It was an independent little, like an old eight track. And they would put one story on each eight track and throw it in, hit the button and instantly start. I went, oh, that's really great. That's random access. And all of a sudden I look and I see Chet Huntley. Now Chet Huntley uh, was the anchor of the uh, NBC news at the time, their evening news, like Walter Cronkite, Chet Huntley, Harry Reisner, those guys. So I see Chet Huntley and the same thing. He's like in a t-shirt and he's cigarette smoking and he's got glasses on and all this stuff. And I'm a shock because you never see these people like this on TV. And all of a sudden, some guy throws his finger at him and he goes, NBC Monitor News, New York, Chet Huntley reporting. I'm sorry. It was NBC News on the hour, Chet Huntley reporting. And I'm, I'm my jaws dropped. The guy looks at me and says, you're hungry? And I said, sure. He says, come on, let's go to lunch. I'm like, huh? So we walked down to this room where he works, which was the newsroom with all the teletype machines, chunka, 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 chunka. He tells me to sit in a chair. I sit in a chair for a minute. And all of a sudden, he goes away, and there's ding, 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 and there's one more ding, 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 and that's the UPI bell code for a bulleted. And all of a sudden, the room goes into pandemonium, and someone not much older than me hands me a piece of paper and says, "Quick, take that to Hourly's." And I'm like, "Okay." So I run out in the hall. I got this piece of paper in my hand, and it's like Hourly's, NBC News on the hour. It's worth a shot. So I run down the hall and I see the glass doors and I open the door and I, there's a guy sitting at a desk and I hand him the piece of paper, bald headed guy who later became Herb. And he looked at the piece of paper and he said, great, bring me the first lead. And I walked out and I, I'm back out in the hall now. And where the heck was the room the guy brought me to? And all of a sudden I listen and I hear the chunka, chunka, chunka of the teletype machines. And I go back. And I'm in the room now and I'm looking and there was this blue machine, which was a UPIA wire. And that's the machine I saw the guy rip the paper from. So I look and the, those teletype machines in those days, they had a piece of glass in front and the, the typewriter mechanism or the teletype mechanism was going 35 characters per minute. And what it was typing out was one STLD, one STLD first lead. Okay, so I'm reading it. And what it says is, Mexico City, a Boeing 737 Air Mexico airliner crashed upon takeoff on this rainy capital city runway. You know, and it was a plane crash. And what I had in my hand was the bulletin for the plane crash. And what I did was I brought it to the radio studio so that Chet Huntley could do the big thing in news, which is this just handed in plane crash, Mexico City. Now, NBC wants everyone to stay tuned for more information on the plane crash. And Chet, having done this before, says, so stay tuned to this NBC station for more on the Mexican plane crash. And that gets them all excited. Cut back to the room. I'm standing there and Lazo comes over while I'm reading the first lead. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm waiting for the first lead. And he went, huh? And the, the guy who handed me this paper went, wait, where'd you bring the paper? Where'd you bring the paper? And I, you know, maybe he thought it was floating in the toilet somewhere. And I said, uh, glass doors at the end of the hall, bald headed guy. And the guy who was taking me to lunch goes, sit. And he yelled at me. And now I'm 14 years old. So my bottom lip is starting to quiver. My father is going to beat the crap out of me 
because I cut school to do this. And I'm sitting there and I'm waiting for the cops and I'm shaking like a leaf. And finally, the, all the pandemonium dies down and the guy sits, sits next to me and he says, all right, I'm docking him a day's pay and I'm paying you. You want to work here? And I went, sure. So I started working at NBC News at 14 years old. Now, how could that happen? Well, it seems like in the newsroom, everybody that was around me was 15, 16, 17, and they were the sons and daughters of RCA, NBC, and subsidiary companies' kids. This was nepotism on a grand scale. And I looked like one of those kids. So I started working weekends. I was paid $37.50 out of the news manager's dinner budget, 30, $37.50 a shift. So as things moved along, as I was 14 and a half, as a vetted employee, I was working two shifts on Saturday and two shifts on Sunday. And in those shifts, I made $37.50 a shift. So I was bringing home $150. Bucks. My dad was a teamster driving a truck loading stone out in all the elements, breaking his fingers, breaking his back. He made 145 a week. And my parents just were in awe because we lived in this stupid walk-up apartment, you know? So I gave all my money to my parents and I continued in school. And the worldly perspective of being at NBC News and being in that room, so that as soon as anything happened in the world, it was at my fingertips, literally gave me not only a perspective on the world and people, but I also worked with people who were much, much older than me. And it matured me in a very accelerated way, which served me very well for the rest of my life. So it was a real experience. But the, the couple of moments that I just point out was I worked on the Apollo missions. Okay. I slept in the Lunar Rover because on, in Studio 8H, which later would become the studio Saturday Night Live was shot in, they had a big moonscape all set up and they had the command capsule and uh, you know Douglas Sprinkley would be in there with the, with the guys throwing switches. What are they doing right now? Well, right now they're firing the retro rockets. He throws switches. But they also had that little car that went around the moon with, they drove around. <laughs> so I slept in that one night. <laughs> and a security guard comes in around two in the morning. He says, what are you doing? And I said, well, I, you know, I worked on overnight and I didn't want to go home. He says, well, you can't sleep here. <laughs> so I went into the control room and I set up three chairs and I slept in the 8-H control room. But I had a lot of great stuff. And I even have home. Uh, in the old days, they didn't have electronic ways to put type on the screen. So they used a card with uh, white type on black. And I have one card that says live from the moon, which is what everybody saw on the bottom of the screen as Armstrong was walking. And I also have live from Wapakoneta, Ohio, which is where his mom was what they had a camera in there and her reaction when her son walked on the moon and it was live from Wapakoneta, Ohio. So I have those kinds of things. And, and also at NBC in those days, that's when all the game shows, Concentration, Jeopardy, uh, Sale of the Century, He Said, She Said, these are all game shows that came out of 30 Rock. So I was totally like in a, in a play. And plus it was the, the Carson show. We had the Johnny Carson show. And I met a lot of great stars. I met uh, Chuck Connors. I met Eric Clapton. I met Bob Hope. I just, it was a wonderful way to grow up. All before, and I quit NBC when I was 18 years old after the uh, 72 election. And that's a, a longer story, but I'll give you the quick, I think we have about a minute left. I'll give you the quick thing. I was assigned to the UPI A-Wire in Studio 5B, which was the radio studio. And the UPI A-Wire on election night was running only election news. So various results of congressional and senatorial and gubernatorial races were coming up on the UPI plus the presidential race. But there was a new machine right next to me. It was called the Camden Line. And the Camden Line was a direct line to the computers, RCA computers in Camden, New Jersey. And they were doing something nobody had ever heard of before. It's 1972. They were going to do a computer projection. They were taking all this data and putting it into a computer, and they were going to try and predict who won. So in my orientation that night, I was told, this is what you do. When the UPIA wire goes off, you rip the copy, which is what we did. We ripped copy, and you hand it to this gentleman, Bill Fitzgerald, who had been in the news business since the spark gap. Bill must have been 80 years old, but he was good, and he was a good news writer. 
And then the piece of paper goes to Bill. Bill then gives the piece of paper to the Russ Tornabin, who was the producer. Russ judges it for its news value, hands it back to another writer. The writer writes it, hands it back to Russ. Russ okays it, puts it in the script. And then Peter Hackis, I don't know if anybody remembers Peter Hackis, but he was the anchor on NBC News. Chet and David, uh, Chet Huntley, David Brinkler upstairs in 8H. Uh, hosting the, the television, and I was in 5B, and Peter Hackis was the voice of NBC News on election night, and then he would switch to various desks with other, like John Palmer and people like that. But anyway, so my, that's my job. And I said, what's this? And I said, well, that's the Camden line. If that goes off, okay, all you got to do is bring it right to Russ. I'm like, okay. So we're running, we're running, everything's going great. And at 820, we're doing a break, the 820 break. And the broadcast always ends with Peter Hackers going, so for insurance company of North America, this has been uh, election night coverage of NBC News, election night 72. Stay tuned to this NBC station for more as election night 72. And he does this whole wrap out. And then they play a jingle. And the jingle was INA, insurance company of North America, right? He's wrapping it up. And all of a sudden, the Camden line goes off. <laughs> And I see it go off. It's the first time it's done anything all night. And I rip it. And I look, Tornabin is up and off the seat. Bill Fitzgerald's not there because it's the end of the broadcast. So I grab the piece of paper and I run to Peter Hackus's desk. And I knocked over a garbage can. <laughs> Wait, it was a little waste paper basket. And I slam this piece of paper down on Peter Hackus's desk. Now, Peter Hackus is what we've called an old rip and read man. And rip and read means you sight read the news as it's handed to you. So anything I give him, he reads with great authority. So had I handed him the grocery list, it would have been this just in one quarter milk, half a pound of ham, quarter pound of cheese. And he would have read it like that, you know? So I slap this thing down in front of him. He picks it up and he says, now here's the thing. See, I didn't know what it said, really. It could have said, NBC News is about to predict. It could have said, hey, we don't know. Maybe in a little while we might predict. It could have been, hey, we're just testing the line. But I was pretty sure it said what he said. This just in, NBC News projects Nixon the winner with 52% of the, and then he realizes what he said. And he goes, again, this just in, NBC News predicts Nixon. And I see Russ Torneman, the producer, sit back in his chair. Now, if, here's a little secret about NBC. If you remember, dong, dong, dong. let me do that again. Bing, bong, bong, or something like that. You remember the chimes of NBC. That was more than just music. That told the network to drop. So when you heard the chimes out of New York or Chicago or, or any of our O and O's, and you heard the chimes, that meant local stations dropped the network and go back to local programming. So <laughs> the poor engineer, it's a, it was a glass key on the console that you turn and it ran the chimes. And I see the guy reaching for the key through the glass and Russ Thornton but smacks his hand away. <laughs> and the guy's like, what? And Peter Hackis again says, you know, once again, NBC News has, well, if you're in a news business, it's being first with everything. So by the 840 break, ABC and CBS had jumped on board, but we were first that night. So anyway, Hackis goes like this, the tournament, and, we hit, dong, 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 and it's dead quiet, dead quiet. And all of a sudden you hear footsteps like in a movie and it's Russ Tornabin walks in. What happened? And Peter, I don't know, somebody puts on my desk. <laughs> and Bill Fitzgerald is standing there. And my boss suddenly shows up, the guy who hired me. And he says, go up to TV now. So I sneak out the back and I go up to 8H. And I go to 8H. And, and uh, I, I know one of the cameramen. So I'm saying, hey, how you doing? He says, hey, do we stand here. Now, we had these things on the floor that had fishtail knobs. And I don't know if you remember the way they used to cover it, but it looked like a destination sign of the subway station or a train station. And you just the numbers and the numbers would change on the big board that was on TV. And every, every desk assistant had a board. Like I had Illinois governor race and I'm turning knobs for numbers and stuff based on a piece of paper. And he says, all right, Tom wave. So I turn and I wave and I was on national TV that night. My aunt Sophie saw me in Florida, called my mother. Said, I saw Tommy on TV. Anyway, that was my election night. The next day, and this is the end of the story. The next day, there was a manager's report, which I used to help print out during the weekend, but not during the week. And it said, NBC News was number one again on election night in a grand tradition as Bill Fitzgerald, <laughs> and they gave the entire credit to Bill, 
uh, for having done this because they looked and found out I was underage and I was being paid by petty cash. And technically I was nobody's kid. So they fired me the next day <laughs> for not being a vice president's son. Two days later, I was hired back as I had been hired back the last three times they fired me for not belonging to anybody, not being blood. Anyway, that's my story that, that, that took me from 14 to 17. I love that story. I, it's like a, sort of like a childhood dream, I guess, of a young people of to, to be able to be able to walk into a TV studio or radio stu studio and somehow stumble into a job and then do a good job. And, you know, sort of obviously you've had a career uh, as a consequence, right? Well, yeah. Actually, the best part about being at NBC was uh, in college, uh, there was a journalism class. I was a freshman. And I saw this journalism class uh, and it was an honors class, which means you have to be almost a graduate or a postgraduate class. <laughs> and I walked in, I sat down and the guy said, what are you doing here? You, you know, you have to have uh, journalism 101, journalism 102. I said, I worked at NBC News for, for four years. He said, sit. So I sat <laughs> and he was the, uh, his name is Adrian Meppen. He was the uh, executive producer of CBS News. And I had logged in the morning before I went to school. I used to work the overnight shift and then go to school in the morning. I'd get up at five o'clock and I'd do the Today Show. And then at seven o'clock, the Today Show would go on the air and I would log the CBS and ABC morning news. I'd write what they covered. I'd type it up. It would go on what we call the Twix. And by the time I got to homeroom in high school, my report was in a thousand bureaus around the world. So I, I, when I told him that, he made me sit. And at the end of, the, end of my freshman year, he offered me a job at CBS as nice. a line producer, making, in those days, what would be the equivalent of $100,000 today, right out of college. I didn't take the job because I was in a band, and I went across the country in a band, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, listen, I'm almost out of time, so... How do you think that childhood experience impacted who you are today? I understand that you want on to become a, a drummer and do some other things, but I know, but you also wrote quite a bit. So do you think that impacted you as a writer or just as a human being? What, tell me real fast what you think, how you think that childhood experience impacted who you are today. Well, that childhood experience killed my childhood and made me immediately <laughs> a young adult, if yes. not mature. Uh, so I was used to working with older people. So I had no problem matriculating through life and anything I wanted to do. What I wound up doing was being a creative director in an advertising agency for 40 years, which also meant I got to write, direct, and produce commercials. I've done a couple of movies. I've done a lot of uh, industrial videos, but it's all from that initial confidence that came from dealing with some of the most biggest known people in the world and effectively interfacing with them, not being the kid on, you know, sitting in the corner, but being a, a vital part of, of, the, of the arrangement, you know, whatever it was, and people trusting me and, and, and giving me responsibility and me fulfilling that. And that cycle has always served me well. That confidence, cockiness, whatever you want to call it, is why I'm a director, why I can walk in and I don't care if you're Al Pacino or some kid right out of, you know, a drama class, I can direct you and I can make you feel good about your performance and more importantly, give you, give you all the guidelines you need to make a good performance. And that's the same thing in authoring. So what I do as a book coach. I direct writers. I direct them through their manuscript. And in my class online, I direct writers who really want to become authors, but have somehow been frustrated. I direct them on how to write a more publishable manuscript. I love it, man. I, I got to take your class. I've been Definitely. writing books. I've, I've written 27 uh, plays and 14 books, but I think I can learn a lot from you. You sound like uh, a, a master teacher. And also, obviously, I like the idea of being sort of a master director. Or, or I've always believed in my heart that people just need encouragement and some instruction, both. You know, you don't want to yep. make people feel badly about what they do. You make them feel good about it. You also want to make them realize it can be done, but it takes effort, you know, and I'm sure there's more to it than that, but your class probably articulates it better than that. But fantastic. I, I loved your story, man. I was, I just loved it. I don't know. I learned a lot and uh, everything you said, because I'm, maybe I'm a little older than you, but anyway, I'm familiar with everybody you're talking about in the story. And yeah. uh, man, that's just, that's just wild stuff. I love your confidence too. I love it. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for the opportunity. Well, thank you for coming on the show, Tom, for that fantastic story, wonderful story. 
insightful story. I do want to take his class. I'd also like to thank my sponsors, Sidelining Publishing, publishers of quality books, and LaughSaver.com. Visit LaughSaver.com and record your laughter. We'll keep it for you now and forever. LaughSaver.com All right, I'm going to end this show a little differently. I'm going to end this show with One Little Act of Kindness by Susan Salador. So until next time, this is Jay Reak asking you all to please stay safe out there and try not to hurt anybody. One little act of kindness can go a long, long way. Two little acts of kindness can brighten anyone's day. Three little acts of kindness can make a beautiful sound. Many acts of kindness help the world go round. One little loving word can go a long, long way. Two little loving words can brighten anyone's day. Three little loving words can make a beautiful sound. Many loving words help the world go round. One can go a long, long way. Two little seeds sown can brighten anyone's day. Three little seeds sown can make a beautiful sound. Many seeds sown help the world go around. One little child. Can go a long, long way. Two little children's laughter can brighten anyone's day. Three little children's laughter can make a beautiful sound. Many children laughing help the world go round, and many seeds sown. Help the world go wrong